am in the middle of a, of a teaching series on the supernatural life. If you're here last week, we talked about um, um, Elisha said to a servant, servant goes out and he sees a great army that's against them and he comes in and he's full of fear. And Elijah says, God, open his eyes so that he can see. And Elisha's servant, his eyes were open and he looked up. If you were here, you remember this. It says that he looked around and there were chariots of fire from heaven. And I want you to know today, if you know Jesus and you love God, there are chariots of fire on your side today. And I want us to have a supernatural perspective. If the way you see life is everything that you see and what you do and that's what life consists of, you're, you're, you're certainly coming short of the true realities. There is the spiritual life and the spiritual world that's more real than the world that we live in. And God is for you and he's not against you and he loves you. He's not here to destroy you. He wants to show you kindness. And so we talked about just that supernatural life and having our eyes open to that. Today I'm talking about provision, supernatural and the supernatural life, how God provides. I want you to know today, God provides our every need according to his riches and glory. And today I want to take these truths and I really want to really hone in on this thing of God's provision because I think sometimes in our understanding of life and how the world works, we really shortchange what God can do in, in life and through us because he doesn't work according to the patterns of the world that we live by. There, there is a supernatural life and a supernatural kingdom that he has opened up and made available to the body of Christ. Listen, God is real. Can I just say that today? He's real. He's not a doctrine and he's not out of a doctrinal book and he's not a part of a denomination. He is God and he created the heavens and the earth. And there's one God and one Lord and his name is Jesus and he loves you today. And he's real and he's here if you'll just reach out to him. So, so many times we come into these things and we, you know, we, we sort of go through the motions. But there is a real God who loves you and he has a plan for your life. So today we're going to talk about the supernatural life and the way that God provides supernaturally. Pray with me. Father God, I pray today in this place, God, that you would just be rich in your presence and your love here. God, I pray, Lord, from, uh, Lord for every person that's walked through the door, whether they've been saved for 30 or 40 years or they're new Christians, or Lord, maybe they're here today and they're not even believers. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to see the fullness, Lord, of the plan that you have for the people of God. And, Lord, that we would live by faith, God. Well, Lord, we wouldn't live by sight, but we would live, God, according to the principles, Lord, of Christ and the kingdom of God. And, Lord, not the mere things that surround us every day. God, I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be open to this supernatural life of provision. Lord, help me as I declare these truths. Hide me behind the cross. And, Jesus, I pray that you and you alone would be seen in this place today. Amen. Amen. Read with me in Psalm chapter 37 and verse 25. Now, this is King David, and he's in his older years, and he says this. He says, once I was young, and now I am old. Yet I have never seen the godly abandoned, in some of your translations it will say forsaken. I have never seen the godly abandoned or forsaken, or the children of God begging for bread. Now, I'm don't know if I'm as old as David was, but you can see I have a few gray hairs, okay? And uh, I want to join in with David today in this pro proclamation and just say to you, I've lived a lot of life on both sides. And my declaration of faith to you is this, is folks, I've lived a lot of life and I have never seen the righteous forsaken. And I have never seen God's seed beg for bread. Today, he loves you. He wants to provide for you. Now listen, when David said this, when he writes this, he's older. So he's living in a palace and he's a wealthy king. And you look at that and go, well, it's easy for you to say, David, because you're living in the big palace and you're a wealthy king. But he is also drawing upon the days that he lived in a cave, the Adullam cave, when he lived in times of want, when there was a king, Saul, that was out to destroy him. He's saying, even in those moments, God, when it seemed like everything was going bad, God, you never forsook me. You never left me. There's days that I thought I was going to die, but Jesus, you preserved me. Is there anybody in church today, and your testimony is, God, there were times in my life that I never, I did not know how I was going to get through, but Jesus, somehow, you brought me through. Amen. Today, 
as we come into this, uh, I, I want to talk to you about what it means. Because the key word in this is it says, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. If you go through the scripture, it says, it, it says that the wicked will be uh, destroyed. So it doesn't say that everybody will, will not be forsaken, but the righteous will not be forsaken. And you say, well, so is he saying that good people won't be forsaken? That's not what he's saying. He's saying the righteous. What does it mean when he says that the righteous will not be forsaken? Folks, I believe that when he says this, look at Abraham. Abraham was declared righteous because of his faith. So he doesn't say that only perfect people are not forsaken, but he said the righteous. Who are the righteous? The righteous are the ones who live by faith. So what he's saying is for people who live by faith, not by law, not by works, not by human effort, but those who live by faith, they will never be forsaken and they will not ever have to beg for bread. Now, you know, we live in a world that is built on economies, is built on the dollar bill. And folks, I want to tell you, I'm certainly not saying to you here that, you know, America's economy is going to fall apart next week. I don't know. I can tell you this, though. We are approaching $19 trillion in debt. You do the math out for 300 million people, that is $60,000 for every man, every woman, every child. And that doesn't even include entitlements. Uh, we have learned to become dependent on government. We've learned to become dependent on our 401ks. We've learned to become uh, dependent on our government. And listen, I'm not anti-government. America is the greatest country on the earth. So I'm not saying this. But what I'm saying to you today is this. When we talk about the righteous not being forsaken, we're not taught, we, we, we can become so comfortable in the world that we live in. But when God is your God, it doesn't matter who's in control. God will provide for your every need. It doesn't matter what the economic system is. When you live according to the kingdom and the kingdom of God, you never have to worry, will my needs be met? Because God will meet your needs and he is not bound to the American dollar. He's not uh, bound to the euro. He's not uh, bound to the Chinese government. And listen, you look around the world right now and there's, there's dominoes. You, you see countries like Greece and Ireland and other countries that, you know, financial institutions are not reliable like they would have been several years ago. And folks, we have to learn that our dependency is not on financial institutions. Our dependency is on God. Years ago, I was in Moldova. It's uh, one of the, the reasons I was there is human trafficking. It's a major hub for human trafficking. It's the poorest country in Europe. And I was in the capital, if anybody's ever been there, is in Kishna. And I was walking through one day. We just had a few moments, and uh, they had a few uh, people that were out selling little trinkets. And I was just looking, and I came across uh, a person that was selling. They had, they had bills. It was money that was for sale. And what it was was from the old Russian Empire they had the old rubles. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And they were selling the rubles that had completely gone. At one time, I, I bought an entire year's wages of rubles, and I paid about 10 cents. There's times that people would have shot and killed for those rubles. Today, they're worthless. They're worth 10 cents to me, so I could throw them in a box and one day say that I had rubles from the old Russian Empire. But they're worthless. And folks, what I'm saying to you is, is we come and we talk about God's provision. I want to just turn your thinking for just a moment because it is easy. We live in probably the most stable country in the world. And it's easy to look at where we live and how we live and we trust in what's around us. I'm saying to you today as Christians, as born again Christians, we have a kingdom that's greater than the American government. We have a kingdom that's greater than the financial systems of this world. And God wants us to trust in him. Because it doesn't matter who's in charge, he ultimately is always in charge. Amen? So praise God. With that in mind, I want you to turn to 1 Kings 17. As you're turning there, let me say this to you as well. Listen, I'll probably, this will probably be, I'll give you quite a while to get to the, the passage. When it says that the righteous... What does it mean, the righteous? Let me just take a moment here because I want you to understand this. How many know the, 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 the story of the prodigal son? And you know the son, he had all the wealth in his house and he, he just didn't want to live in the house anymore. I don't think he really understood how great his father was. So he goes to his father and he says, Dad, you know, I want my inheritance, which is brutal. 
And he goes off, and the Bible says that he squanders his inheritance. He winds up in a pig pen. And he's sitting in the pig pen, and this is what the scripture says. It says that he comes to himself. He realizes, I'm in a pig pen. How many know that that's a brutal awareness there? He wakes up one day, and he's like, man, I was not born to live in a pig pen. How many of you were not born to live in a pig pen? He wakes up to himself, and he says, you know, I could go back to my father's house and be a servant. That's why I know that he doesn't understand his father, because his father would ne never take him back as a servant. His father would only take him back as a son. But he comes to this awareness, and he goes, I'm going to go back, and maybe I can just be a servant in my father's house. So you know the story. The father is sitting at the, he's on the car, you know, he's out on the front door. He's waiting, and he sees his son from a distance. And the scripture says that he runs out to him, and he does three things. The first thing that he does is he puts a, a ring of gold on his finger. It's a, it's a signet of power and authority. And he places this on his finger. But the second thing that it says, it says that he takes a robe and he wraps him in, the, in a robe. And that robe is a robe of righteousness. What, he, what the father was doing is, is saying this, listen, I know you've rebelled. I know you've gone and done your own thing. I know you've squandered the wealth. I, I know that uh, you have left my house. But today, not because of anything you've done, but because of my mercy, I want to wrap you in righteousness because I see that there's a brokenness inside of you. And I want you to know that when we come to Jesus, that's what he does. He wraps us in his righteousness. We don't have to earn it. We can't earn it. We can't buy it. And he does that because he loves us. Amen. How many of you are glad that he does that? Amen. But now there's a third thing that he gives them. And the third thing that he gives to the son is shoes, which is kind of odd. Well, why, why are you giving him sandals? And I believe that this is what he was saying. He was saying, listen, my grace completely covers you. But listen, there is a walk of faith for you. To live in my house, you're going to have to take steps of faith. And church, listen, everybody wants the fullness of God's grace. And I want it too. I need it desperately. But there is also a life of walking by faith, a step by step of walking in faith and difficult times and doing what God commands us to do and walking in obedience. And so much of the church wants the free grace of God. Thank God for that. But you can't forget that he's also give, given you shoes to take steps of faith by. So when we come to God's provision, I would be robbing you if I didn't say to you that there is a life that demands something on our part. It doesn't, it's not, it's, the demand isn't like a certain amount, but the demand is a life of faith. And God demands that. God demands if you're going to walk with me and you're going to live in this house, I cover you by grace. But listen, there is a life of faith and maturity and walking with me that I have called you to. And folks, listen, there is a life of walking by faith. So as we go to this, um, I'm going to, as I go through and I read the story, I'll get to a part that you need to understand. I, I believe in tithing. I don't believe in tithing the way that some people teach it and that they say that you're under a curse if you don't give. I don't believe that. I don't, if, you're, uh, if you're truly a Christian and Christ lives inside of you, I don't believe that you can be under a curse. Because Jesus lives inside of you and he would be cursing himself. So I don't believe that. But I do believe that we give and we do it by faith. Tithing did not start in the law. Some people say, well, that's just law. But tithing began, if you go to Hebrews chapter 7, it goes back to Melchizedek in Genesis when Abraham comes to him and he pays a tithe. He doesn't do it out of law. He does it just out of love. But it's a 10% tithe. I believe that that is what we give to God by faith. Now, I don't think that you're under a curse if you don't do that. But what I do believe is that as we give, God puts us into a supernatural economy which is, the, which, which is the kingdom of God. And then, of course, there's, you know, giving as well. So when, when it comes to missions or when it comes to, you know, buying a Thanksgiving dinner. And, folks, here's the bottom line of it is this, is that the faith part is being like Jesus. And understand this. Jesus gave his life at the cross for the church and for the lost and for the broken and for the hurting. And if we start to behave like Christ, what are we going to do? We're going to give to the church and to the lost and to the broken and to the hurting because that's the life of God, not by law, not because he's going to be mad at me and hit me over the head and judge me, but because we do it by faith, 
which works by love. And when you start to operate in that kind of a way, you understand that this is a part of the kingdom. It, there's, there's, there's grace, yes, but there's also steps of faith. If you don't understand this, when I get to the part of the story that I get to, you'll think that, it's, that I'm a terribly, uh, that the story is a terrible story. But it's not. You have to see it in the eyes of the kingdom. So go with me. We're talking about Elijah. Last week we talked about Elisha. Um, now, uh, to, to give you a little bit of the setting, the two most wicked, uh, most wicked king and his wife, Ahab and Jezebel, lived during this time. And they were absolutely wicked people. Uh, they were uh, false worshipers. They were idolaters. And the, the scripture says that they were the worst of all the kings. And so, anyways, they rise up during this time. But you know, when the enemy comes in like a flood, how many of you know that God will raise up a standard against him? And so what God does is he raises up Elijah to stand as a testimony to the children of Israel during this great time of wickedness. So if you go with me to chapter 17, it says, Now Elijah, who was from uh, Tishba and Gilead, told King Ahab, As surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, the God that I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. To be exact, it would be three and a half years. Not only would there not be rain, but there wouldn't even be uh, dew that would come on to the, the plants. Now, um, just to give you a little idea of what's happening here, so you go, well, why would God bring this famine? The false god that Ahab and Jezebel would worship would be Baal, and it was the god of fertility. So when you look at the scriptures here, what they would do is this, is they would come and sacrifice their children, they would make other sacrifices, and they would say, God, we're sacrificing to you. Now in return, you bless us with rain and crops. And God was coming along and saying, listen, I will dry this land up so that you know that your worship of Baal is false. And you'll turn to me in three and a half years, I'll bring rain. And you know there was a confrontation with the prophets of Baal and Elijah. And they come together. And you, you ask yourself, why would anybody ever believe Ahab and Jezebel while you have this great man of God, Elijah? Why would they ever believe uh, why, why would they turn away from Elijah? But look at this. They lived in a palace, and they were wealthy, and they had money. So when you looked at the outside, you go, well, Ahab and Jezebel is living in a palace. They certainly look to be blessed. Look how their God has blessed them. And Elijah, we're looking at you right now, and, you know, you're kind of looking a little grubby there. You're looking kind of poor there. And you're really telling us that you're the one that God has blessed. And they're the ones that God has cursed. And it was a false understanding. And folks, listen, our culture and even much of the church has gotten this wrong. That somehow we think that people who are poor are under a curse and people who are rich are blessed by God. But that's not true. And it goes in 1 Timothy, it says this. It says the people that come and think that godliness is gain or wealth, that you've misunderstood the gospel. It says this. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain, and if you, have clothes to, if you have clothes to wear and food to eat, you should be content and thankful for God for all that he's provided. So let me just ask you, how many of you have clothes to wear? Thank God you have clothes to wear today. How many of you have food to eat? Listen, if you don't, before you leave, we have a food pantry, and we'll give you food, okay? God has blessed us, and sometimes... We really don't understand the depth of the blessing. That some people look at outward and they go, well, this person is blessed because they have money. This person is cursed because they don't. Now understand this. God can, I have seen some of the greatest people of life and faith who are wealthy and they give and their money doesn't own them. And they own their money and they serve God and they love God. Amen. And they stand as a great testimony. I have also seen poor people who are greedy. <laughs> Amen. Who care more about money than anything else in life. And they are just as under a curse and away from God as they can be. You cannot define how a person is blessed or cursed on their financial condition. There are poor people who are incredibly blessed. And there are poor people who, whose life is a mess spiritually. And there are wealthy people whose lives are a mess. And there are wealthy people who are incredibly blessed. God says this, look at the heart and you'll find 
who's blessed and who's under a curse. Amen? So when you look at this story, I want you to understand that he says, listen, I'm going to dry all of this up because I want you to show, I want to show all the people of Israel who the true provider is. Go to verse 2. It says, then the Lord said to Elijah, go to the east and hide by Kareth uh, Brook uh, near uh, where it enters on the Jordan River. This would be the place that the, a few hundred years before this, the children of Israel would come into the promised land through this area, and it would only be a few years later, well, about 800 years later, that Jesus would be baptized in this area. I believe it's a spiritual connotation to the area that they're at. And he says, drink from the brook and eat from what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So here's God's plan, because he gives the prophecy that the whole place is going to be a famine, and there's not going to be food to eat or, or, or water uh, to drink. How many know that if I prophesied that, the next thing I would do is move to Canada, okay? I would, <laughs> I'd find another place to live. But God tells them to, to hey, there's going to be a great famine. Now I want you to exist and live in the middle of it, and I am going to supernaturally provide for your needs. And he takes something that's very natural and he works in a supernatural way to meet the needs of Elijah. He says, go to the brook and you'll drink the water that I provide uh, in a place where there's no rain. And then I'm going to take ravens and they're going to bring you food. Now, how many know, have you ever been to the beach? How many have ever had a bird bring you lunch? The birds come and they eat your lunch, okay? I'm a Florida guy. I'm not real smart, but I know that. So you go and the birds, whatever, they come to steal your food. But these are supernatural birds, okay? And they're nasty ravens, by the way. They're unclean animals considered in the Old Testament. But God says, I'm going to take these ravens and they are going to supernaturally bring you bread and meat every day. They're going to bring you an Egg McMuffin for the morning. And uh, in the evening, they're going to bring you a Philly steak sandwich. But every day, they're going to bring you a meal. Now, if... If you're Elijah, you have to be going, all right, God, so this is the plan. There's a famine in the land. I go step by the brook, and you're going to bring birds to bring me my lunch and my dinner. How many of you would be like, yeah, thank you, uh, for real? <laughs> but he believed God because he was a man of faith. And he goes there, and the scripture says, so Elijah did as the Lord told him. And he camped beside uh, the Kareth Brook, east of the Jordan, and the ravens brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening. And he drank from the brook. But after a while, the brook dried up, for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. And I want you to see this, because I would say after a while, he's got ravens coming and bringing him food every day. How many would like that set up? You don't even have to cook. You're just kind of like, all right, where are the ravens at? I'm ready for my steak sandwich. Uh, <laughs> that's a nice setup. Ladies, come on. You know. <laughs> This is a good setup. Just, I mean, we're talking delivery. This is takeout. And it's coming right to the brook, Kareth there. And so he's, you know, so he's, he's, he's in this place and God is providing. But then the provision begins to dry up. Has anybody ever been in a place like that in your life? Where you've come and you go, man, God is providing. And then you lose your job. And then you go, ooh, you're not going to provide that way anymore. You're going to provide another way. Guys, I can tell you, I, I could go through so many testimonies about God leading me away from one place into another place. We, we were at a place where we were making a really good salary package uh, in ministry. And God called us to be missionaries. And we showed up to the missions thing to find out what our salary would be. And they said to us, well, your base salary is 19000 And I'm like, well, what's the, tell me what's not the base. Because <laughs> I'm going to Wick to get me some cheese. And I need a block of cheese. I mean, that, I need food stamps. I mean, it, was, it was like, how am I going to provide for my family for $19,000 a year? And by the time I have two kids and, a, you know, live in a life, I, I, how do I live on that? But I want to tell you today, God will provide for your every need. Sometimes he dries up a brook and then he causes another brook to start. I, I told the, the first service today, uh, this last weekend we had a, mar a marriage. Uh, if you notice, uh, our, one of our keyboard players um, is she was not here today, and one of our guitarists, uh, Ramon and Bree, were married this last Friday. Well, praise God for that. And, uh, we got a lot of marriages happening, by the way. I think it's in the water. So, anyways, I won't say who needs to be drinking the water. 
you know who you are. Um, but anyway, through the process, uh, Pastor Robbie Shira, who was our first associate pastor, was here and he helped with the wedding. And I had a great time talking with him and just hearing what God is doing there. He's a good friend. I knew him when he was 16 years old. I was his youth leader and he came and served with us. But, you know, when, the, when he and Angie were here uh, for that first year, they were here for about a year, and then God called them back to pastor in Georgia. And thank God for, you know, I look back at it now because he's being used to help with church planning and God's really doing a great work in his church. So thank God for that. But I remember when it happened, we were right at a time in the church. A few of you were around. And just, just to say this to you, we started with seven people. And all the, most of the seven people, there's only two of them that went, they were at a church and went to their pastor and their pastor said, come on. The other ones were just kind of drifting from church to church. We had seven people. We started the church. And, you know, God did some good things. But we were in a storefront for a while. And while we were there, the people that owned the storefront said, hey, you got to get out. And you got like two weeks. So we had to get out of our storefront. We had nowhere to go. We put our stuff into a storage container. And we went to the AMC Theater. I'm, every time I pass by the AMC theater, I go, well, that used to be our church. We did, by the way, have plenty of parking. <laughs> Just saying. And, uh, but while we were there is when Pastor Robbie and Angie came to us and said, hey, God is calling us, you know, to go pastor in Georgia. And then we had two interns, Tim, which now has come back, and, uh, and he and Leo, which is now uh, pastoring and working up in Massachusetts, but they were our interns. And the same time that we were told to get out of our building, uh, they had to go back to school for five months, and then Tim returned to us. And then Robbie and Angie came off the staff. So it basically, of our full-time people, four people left, and it left two of us, and we had to go into a movie theater. How do you know that I was kind of like Elijah, that I was going, God, you know, you provided, the church is growing, God is doing good things. But I was at a place that I was like, how are we going to do this? Because we've got to set up and we've got to tear down. And I'll tell you this. God has provided every need for this church financially, with people to serve, with people to give. And in the midst of the time that I go, God, what are you doing to me? God was providing for me when I didn't know how. And I didn't know how he was going to do it. But at the end of it, the church grew in the movie theater. He provided another location before we got to this location. How many know we've been busy the last few years? Then, about nine months later, Pastor Ryan and Rebecca came on staff with us. They've been here for about two years, and they have been wonderful. And, you know, when Pastor Ryan came back to me a few months ago, and he says, you know, God is calling us back to Chicago to go do inner city planning. Uh, they're not going back to the church they were at. They want to go into the inner city of Chicago and plant churches and plant churches and plant churches. How do you, I mean, how do you say no to that? I mean, thank God for what he's doing there. But in my mind, I go, God, we're at a good place, the church is moving along, and I, I said to him, I was like, don't leave now, but when God says it's time to leave, you got to leave, and here's what I'm saying to you, is that there are times in our life that we think that we need things, and God is saying, I just need that brook to dry up so that I can open up another stream of water and provide for your need. Because I don't want you to trust in the ravens, and I don't want you to trust in the book, uh, the brook careth. I want you to trust in me, because I'll provide your needs. Amen? And praise God, Pastor Matt, Pastor Jonathan, they're coming on staff here. God is blessing us. I don't know what the, the future holds, but I can tell you this. Everything that I need, his hand has provided. And I look around at a church right now, look at a church today in the first service as well, and you know what the answer is in staffs or pastors. The answer is when the body of Christ comes to life and you start to function as God has called you to, listen, this church will stand as a testimony to the city. But God wants to work inside of your life. And so here Elijah comes to this place and he's going, the brook is dried up. There's nothing that's there anymore. And look at verse 8. Then he says, then the Lord says to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath. Now let me just say, the village of Zarephath is where uh, Jezebel was from, the area of Sidon. It was a very wicked area. Where he was going was not with a widow that would be a believer. She was a pagan. She was against the things of God. She worshipped Baal. And God says, I want you to go and live in Zarephath. It's not even in Israel. If you look at a, if you look at a map, it was about 100 miles away. So he had to walk to this place, to the place that God would use as a place of provision. And he says, 
uh, go to the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, and I have instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath, and when he arrived at the gate of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me uh, a little uh, water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, he called to her, and he says, hey, will you bring me a bite of bread as well? But she said, I swear by the Lord your God. She doesn't even swear by Baal. But she says, Elijah, I'm swearing by the Lord your God of heaven that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I only have a handful of flour that's left in a jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. And then my son and I will die. How do you know that? What a sad testimony. But if you're Elijah, you come along and go, God, this is the person that you're going to use to supply my needs through the famine? This is the vessel? And you said you told her to supply my needs, which I'll just say, she will come to that place. But immediately, he has to be like, I just walked 100 miles to get to the place, to the woman that's going to supply all of my needs. And she just told me she's got nothing, and she's going to go, and she's going to bake one last piece of bread, and then her and her son are going to die. That is a pathetic story. How do you know that you would be in that place going, God, you know, please help me there. You know, this isn't looking good. It's not looking good. But can I say this to you? When you come to the place, she served the false gods of this world. When you come to the place that your gods have failed you. When you come to the place that Baal doesn't put any flour in the container. And he doesn't put any oil in the container. When you come to the empty places of life. You become a candidate that God says, will you just trust me? And this is Elijah. Will you just trust that God can put flour and God can supply oil? Can you believe that the supernatural God of heaven can supply all of your needs in the way that he decides to do it? Can you just believe that, woman of widow of Zarephath? Can you believe that? And this woman completely ready to die. Go, go on in the scripture and it says this. It says, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said, but make a little bread for me first. Now, you know, you're listening, and this is the, this is the man of God. How many know that this message can be taken by prosperity preachers and turned and twisted so that you go, well, hey, I know that you're really needy there, you know, elderly lady on a fixed income, but if you buy me a mansion, you know, God will take care of you. It's, 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 it has turned into, in this nation, let me just say this. I believe that probably 100 years ago, the way that the church operated was people didn't give. The pastor, the poor he was, the better off he was. And the church just tried to, you know, most churches just kind of kept those pastors as poor and holy as they could, they could do. And a message came along in the faith movement that said, you know, hey, it's not a, it's not a holy thing to be poor. God wants to meet your needs and he wants to supply needs. And I think that there was a time that that message was very fitting. Now we have swung way over to the pendulum that we're going to people, these people are going on TV and say, you know, send in your $20 so I can have a, you know, private airplane. And like the little widow, widow at Zarephath, that is not what I believe is happening here. I believe what's happening here is that you have a man of faith, Elijah, and he's speaking to this widow. And he's trying to get her to understand the life in the kingdom. And the life in the kingdom is this. Listen, you don't say, God, let me fix the bread and see what I have left over. If that's the way that you serve God, God, I'm going to live my life. And then whatever's left over, uh, here, I'll throw that off to you. What you do, what you're saying in that is that, God, you're, you get the leftovers of my life. But Elijah is trying to say to this widow, put God first. Make him the priority in your life. Amen. Amen. And when he becomes the priority of your life, then that's the life of faith. And now you go and believe that he will supply, he will make provisions for all of your needs. But it has to be first, not, God, let me just see what I have left over and I'll give you a dollar if I have something less. No, you start with the place and you go, God, this is by faith what I give. And now I ask you to make your provisions. Listen, folks, I'm not here... I'm not begging your money. I'm, uh, the last thing in the world that I'm here to do is this. But this is kingdom teaching. And if you don't see this, then Elijah is a really selfish man. 
Because this woman just said to this woman just said to him, "Hey, me and my son are going to have a little last piece of bread, and then we're going to die." Okay, well, ma'am, if you could just make the first bread for me. That's brutal. That's the prophet. No, you have to understand. He's trying to teach her. This is the way we live in the kingdom. And in the kingdom, God goes first. And he was the servant. He was preaching the word. And he was saying, you put God in his word first. And God will meet your needs. I have never seen the righteous who live by faith forsaken or his seed beg for bread. Amen. Amen. And then he says this. He says, you go and, you, and uh, he says, you make a little bread for me first. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord your God of Israel says. There will always be flour and olive oil. Flour is for bread. Jesus is the bread of life. And there will always be olive oil, which is a significant of the Holy Spirit. There will always be left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops will grow again. And so she did as Elijah said. And she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. This was always, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. How many of you know that this is a life of faith? And God says, now your bread basket will never be empty and your oil will always be full. How do you want to live that way? And it doesn't matter who the king is, if it's Jezebel, if it's Ahab, if there's a famine in the land. When God says that he'll provide your needs, he'll provide your needs. We just have to walk this life out in faith of saying, God, you're first. And Lord, I'm going to serve you with all of my heart. And I want to walk in the kingdom by faith. And I don't want to walk through this life just giving you the bare ends of what's left. That is not a life of faith. Amen. I hope that you catch this. You, listen, go into the, you, uh, go, go back to, um, let's see, we'll go back to Exodus chapter 17. As you're turning there, I'm going to tell you another story, and I'll be closing on this. The children of Israel, they're going into the promised land, and God had brought them to a place. They were ready to go into the promised land, and they were full of unbelief. You know, the ten spies came back and says, no, we can't do this. And so they went out to the wilderness, and they're in the wilderness for 40 years. Because of their unbelief. In the wilderness was the time that God would teach them how he could supply for them. And how he could help them for 40 years. How many would like to live in the wilderness for 40 years? You want to go to the desert for 40 years and live? Doesn't, I mean, you talk about chewing on some sand, chewing on some sand. But God put them in the desert for 40 years. Because he wanted to teach them what a life of faith was. And this, if you go back and you read the scriptures, it's, here's a few things that it said. It said that he would give them a cloud by day so the sun wouldn't burn them. And they gave them a fire by night so that they could see the way around them. It says that he gave them clothes that wouldn't wear out and shoes that would never wear out. How many ladies would like to have shoes that wouldn't wear out? I'm going to ask it another way. How many men would like to have wives who had shoes that didn't wear out? That's what I'm talking about. He provided manna from heaven. He provided their every need. You talk about a nutritious meal. How many think that if God made food and he brought it down from heaven and every day they went out and gathered it, how many think that would be nutritious? Every bit of nutrition that they needed, he supplied for it. He loved them. But he wanted them to know because they could only take enough for the day. And then it would go rotten. Why would he do that? Because he's mean? No. He wanted to teach them, I'm your source. I'm your provider. I'll provide for you supernaturally. Trust in me. Believe in me. In church today, listen, in the midst of the world that we live in, God wants to teach you. Don't trust in your 401k. Don't trust in the American dollar. I mean, I'm not saying that, of course, you're going to go, you know, for lunch this afternoon and you're going to use an American dollar. But don't trust in, don't trust in the monetary system. Trust in God that he is your provider. Listen, some of you have jobs. You, you may work at, you know, Baptist or you may work, at, you know, Publix. And Publix is, you know, what God, is, is the raven that God provides for you to pay the bills. Thank God. But don't ever make Publix your provider. God is the one who created Publix to give you the job because he's your provider. If you ever start to see your life 
and your finances this way, all of the glory now goes back to God and you're living in a kingdom and you're not just going through trying to make it. God has supernatural means to supply for his children and he wants us to live a life by faith. Amen. Here, here, go with me in chapter 17 and verse 4. We're going to talk about water for many. He also provided for them water in the desert. At this particular point, they had been without water for about three days. And Moses, they're, they're, they're clamoring and they're upset and they're rebellious. And Moses says, quiet, Moses, Moses replies. Why are you complaining against me? And why are you testing the Lord? But tormented by thirst, they continue to argue with Moses. Why did you bring us out of Egypt? Are you trying to kill us, uh, our children and our livestock with thirst? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, what should I do with these people? They are, already, they, they are ready to, uh, to stone me. Then the Lord said to Moses, walk out in front of the people, take your staff, the one that you used when you struck the water of the Nile, and call some of the elders of Israel to join with you. And I will stand before you at the rock at Mount Sinai. Strike the rock, and the water will come gushing out, and the people will be able to drink. So Moses struck the rock as he was told, and the water gushed out as the elders looked on. In 1 Corinthians it says, and that rock was Christ. Now I want to tell you this. These people in a place, they hadn't had water, they're thirsty. Can you just for a moment put yourself in their position? I don't think that, I mean, they obviously were rebellious, but they... But I get it. How would we react in that place? How would we react if we hadn't had water for several days? And here we are. We're parched. We're in a desert. There's no water. And they're going, man, are we just here to die? But in that moment, Moses is saying, can you just not trust that God will supply your needs? And there they are parched. And God takes Moses and he says, take your staff. That staff is a picture of the cross. And he says, I want you to go to that rock on Sinai and strike it. And when you strike that rock, it's going to bring forth water. It was a picture of Jesus at the cross, the one who meets all of our needs. And when, the, when he strikes, when the cross strikes that rock, which is Christ, water gushes forward. And can you just imagine for the moment that the people that are out there, they're parched, they're dry, and this water just begins to pour over them. You talk about, you know, refreshing. And the summers in Florida can be really hot. The summers and the heat in the desert of Sinai would be far hotter than anything that we've experienced here. And they're parched and they're thirsty and they're dry and that water just begins to flow over them. That was God's provision and it was a picture of the cross. And folks, I'm here to say to you, today, I want to shift. I want you to get your mentality around this understanding. Just like God was trying to do with Elijah through the ravens. Listen, God will meet your needs. Trust him and believe him and ask him. He loves you. He's not out to torture you. You're, there, I know that there's people that are here today and you're going through financial difficulties. There's single moms that are here and you're going, God, I need a husband. I need somebody to help me with my kids. Amen. And I'm, I'm going through struggles. I'm going through battles. God, I need your help. But listen, when you come to that place, you have to believe that God, whatever the need is, that he will come and he will make himself known. And whatever you need at that moment, he'll supply it for you. I can't tell you how many times in life. When, when I was a young Christian, man, I, I quit football. I was playing football at East Tennessee State. I just had um, uh, spring practice. I had some of the highest grades on the team. I was doing really good um, uh, playing nose tackle and so forth. And God told me to quit and, and, and go serve him. So I quit. And I was just going out to minister to people on the streets, knocking on doors. And the only job that I could find, because the economy was so bad in East Tennessee, uh, was at Winn-Dixie. And they, I, I, they could use me for a few hours in the meat cutting place. But what they really needed is somebody to clean out the ashes. Because if you remember back in the day, because I'm old, uh, they used to burn boxes. And it was great in the incinerators, but the problem with it was is that it left these piles of ashes. And I would come in, and I would take a shovel... And I would put the ashes into a bucket. And listen, when I got done at the end of the day, I had ashes up my nose and my ear. Any crevice on my, it was, I mean, I was covered with ashes. And I was making minimum wage. And I'm standing there going, God, this is what you've called me to. I'm not saying that the moments won't be rough. But what I'm telling you 
is that here I am, fully clothed, haven't missed too many meals, and God has supplied my needs, and I'm still kicking, and I still love Jesus, but it's in those moments of great need that you hold on to Jesus. It's when the widow looks in her inside of her cupboard and she says, there's no flour and there's no oil. God, I need you. That's when God says, I'll come and I'll fill that flour and I'll fill up the oil and I'll meet your needs according to my riches and glory. Now listen, you can either choose to live according to the natural elements of this world or you can choose to live in the supernatural economy of God. Today, I would say to you, what if you just said, God, I'm just going to live according to your principles, your way, and I want that supernatural provision in every area of my life. He will give you shoes that won't wear out spiritually. He will give you clothes that won't wear out spiritually. He will meet your every need according to his riches and glory. The question is, do you believe that? Amen. Bow your heads. Worship team if you come. Father God, I pray, Lord, in this place today, Lord, that you would bring an awareness to us, Lord, that this is a supernatural life, Lord. God, everything about this kingdom is supernatural. Lord, Lord, we know that we have to make budgets. We know that we have to have jobs. And Lord, I'm not saying any of this, that we don't need these things. But God, I just pray today, Lord, that somewhere in our understanding that we would not trust in what everybody in this culture trusts in, the systems and the plans and the things of this world. God, I pray that our trust would be in you because we know, Lord, if our trust is in you, the ruble will never come out from under us. Lord, we'll never have a place of want and need because you'll be there to help us. And God, you've given us a great spiritual family to walk with and to believe with. And Lord, to spiritually, God, be connected with. And I pray, God, in this place, Lord, that every need would be met. God, I pray that you would help us. God, I pray for relationships. God, I pray for marriages that are here today and families that are here today that have great needs. God, I pray, Lord, that the riches of heaven, God, would come and meet every need. God, that you would provide. Lord, not just financially what we need, but God, spiritually, everything that we need. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, and I have never seen his seed beg for bread. God, I pray in this place today that we would be men and women of faith in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you just begin to stir hearts today. How many would be here today, and you would just say, in some area in your life, whether it's financially or it could be in relationships or it could be just your spiritual walk with God, you would just be honest today and say, I need the provision of God. My can of oil is a little empty and I need God to put oil in my can. I need him to put some flour in my canister. If that's you and you're here today, will you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand today. We want to pray with you across this place. Praise God. Praise God. There's so many in this place today. Father God, I pray today, God, in these moments, Lord, God, when we're faced with a dilemma, we're faced with a problem, and God, we're faced with your provision, I pray today, God, that we would choose to trust in your provision. God, I pray for people that are here today and they have financial issues. God, help them to walk through those things. God, I pray for people that are here today and their families and relationships and they feel empty and they feel dry. God, they feel like they've walked through the desert. God, I pray today, God, that every man and woman, every teenager in this place would know that you're the God who supplies every need. When people walk through the desert for 40 years, God, you meet every need. God, I pray today in the midst of our desert places, God, that you would bring life and joy and peace and the love of God. Lord, we desperately need you today. God, this isn't just doctrine. This isn't just denominational teaching. God, this is the word. It's the kingdom. It's life. It's truth. And God, I pray, Lord, that this truth, God, would work its way into our hearts. Jesus, that you wouldn't just get the tail ends of our life. You wouldn't just get the leftovers, the pieces that, uh, are, that are left, the crumbs from the table. But God, I pray, Lord, that you would be the first and the priority. God, teach us to live in the kingdom and to live for you in this kingdom. Jesus, we praise you.